are you doing? I'm impressed you are here early Sunday morning. There are better things to do out there, you know. <laughs> I'd like to thank Deepak for organizing this wonderful event. And I thank you for your invitation. I'm very much honored to do this for you. So quantum reality and the metamorphosis of human consciousness. Classical physics was materialism. Everything is explained in terms of moving material particles. The particles are solid, massy, hard, Newton said, so hard as never to wear or break in pieces. In contrast, Werner Heisenberg, the quantum physicist, he said elementary particles, atoms, there are no material particles. This shows that in the last century, physics has undergone a paradigm change. We must now think that the basis of the material world is non-material. There is a part to reality that is real, but we can't see it. It's real because it can affect us. It has potentiality. Reality is an undivided wholeness. And Consciousness is a cosmic property. So the first point, Schrodinger's quantum mechanics is wave mechanics. It's a very powerful uh, theory. It's the basis of operation of all your gadgets, cell phones, TVs, whatever. In this theory, the electrons in atoms, they are not particles, but they are waves, they are standing waves mathematical forms. What kind of forms people were thinking? We owe Max Born the discovery that these waves are probabilities. They're dimensionless numbers. They're ratios of numbers. They carry no mass, no energy, and yet they have the power to determine the visible order of the world. For example, they determine how the molecules in your body interact and keep you alive. So the conclusion is that reality is based on phenomena that transcend the materialism of classical physics. If anybody comes and says in public he's a materialist, he has some explaining to do. In physics, that discovery was a surprise. It's an old hat. Pythagoras already said all things are numbers. Nicolas d'Acusa, a German monk of the 15th century, he said, number was the first model of things in the creator's mind. And then there's Plato. Atoms are mathematical forms. Second point, a part of reality that is there, it doesn't consist of things but of forms which we cannot see. You, you can find in the em empty states of atoms and molecules. You can think of a molecule like of a mountain range with many valleys in it. The valleys, like I've seen or to hear that this, no good, doesn't matter. There are energy holes. Each hole contains a ladder of energy. Each step is a quantized energy and it is characterized by a wave function. Now in each molecule, there are practically infinitely many of such states, but it occupies only one. The others are empty. Quantum chemists call the empty states virtual states. They are real, but you couldn't see them. They are empty, there's nothing there to see. But their logical order exists and defines the logical order of a system. And it defines its future empirical possibilities. I, I went the wrong way. Now you see, when you start talking about non-empirical entities in an empirical science, that's embarrassing, you know. So the pioneers, they tried to explain these things away. Like Niels Bohr, he said, look, we have no experience of things. We only have an experience of our experience. It tells us nothing, just forget about it. Einstein, all of his life, he did not like quantum theory. 
he said there's something wrong with it. Something is missing. It's incomplete. In contrast, I propose that the problem is not that the theory is incomplete, the visible reality is incomplete. It tells us nothing about the non-empirical realm. Specifically, the invisible wave functions of molecules are real because they control empirical phenomena. They control the chemical properties of molecules, their magnetic properties. You can breathe oxygen and it helps your metabolism because it contains invisible degenerate states. I will not talk about the Frank Conan principle because that guy sits there and after 20 minutes he so I have enough examples that show virtual states can affect visible phenomena. They must be real. It's like molecules are guided in their actions by inner images, the wave functions of their states. Now, the concept of inner image, of course, comes from psychology. Brain scientist Gerald Hüther calls inner images all that which is hidden behind the visible surface of living beings and guides them. So in, in chemistry, molecules do nothing that is not steered by their inner images, the wave functions of their virtual states. In life, a human being does nothing that isn't allowed by an inner image in our mind. There is an equivalence of the mental and the physical. Quantum physics is the psychology of the universe. Now, if inner images control everything, here's a slight sidestep, then they also must have controlled the evolution of life. So I propose evolution is not adaptation to the environment, but it's adaptation to the forms in the realm of cosmic potentiality. Yeah, now we can have fun here. <laughs> Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington, a prominent astrophysicist, one time he realized that measurements in physics make sense because the instruments are connected with a known background. For example, if you see a, a light dot move in the, in the skies, it makes sense because you know about the revolution of planets around the sun. The problem with atoms, he says, is that the background is unknown. It's like the background of a brain. A brain has lots of visible things going on, but you don't know what is going on in the mind behind it. So he said, let's think the two together and say the background of atoms is thought-like. Things like this guided him to the view that the stuff of the world is mind stuff that the universe is of the nature of a thought or sensation in a universal mind. If you don't like it, you can just say, oh yeah, like these guys, they don't know what they're talking about. They were so early. I think it will be more productive to think about why did they think it and can we learn about something from them? And he was not alone. Uh, Sir James Hopwood Jeans. He said the universe shows science of a planning mind, like our own mind. And it's not only the old guys. Hans-Peter Dürr, five years ago, he wrote, there's no matter, basically there's only spirit. So you see, physicists, they were looking for this, but it is like the properties that they observed in the quantum world, they kind of nudged them step by step until they realized all of reality is like this. There's a non-empirical realm. It consists of forms. They have the nature of potentiality. The forms, they're waveforms, they're contiguous like waves in an ocean. David Bohm, another pioneer of quantum physics, says reality is undivided wholeness. Well, Mena Scafato says, who's here, physicist, if reality is wholeness, everything comes out of it. Everything belongs to it, including our consciousness. Meaning, consciousness is a cosmic property. 
I know Menas. He, he knew he didn't invent this because Hegel already did, the German idealist philosopher in the 18th century. He said absolute spirit is the primary structure of reality. Everything comes out of it. Everything belongs to it. If you are proud of your thoughts, think twice. They are your thoughts. They are the thoughts of the cosmic spirit, he says, which is thinking in you. He might have thought he invented it, but you know, everything goes back to the Indian sages, then and now. The Indian sages had this allegory of water pots put in the sun. Take a million pots, fill them with water, put them in the sunshine. The sun is in each one of them, but there's only one sun. Take a million people, they all have consciousness, there's only one consciousness. Yeah, we talked last night about it, we don't have to do it anymore. We use words, they mean something. Nobody who says consciousness realizes that it means to be in a state of knowledge together with something. Why do we say that? It, it's not accidental. So, you know, <clears throat> whether you like these things or not, physicists get upset by it. One thing is a fact. By the way in which it describes the world, quantum physics has taken science into the center of ancient spiritual teachings. For example, no, um, the, the wave functions, Schrodinger's wave functions, they are pure forms, no matter, no energy. In Aristotle's metaphysics, there was only one pure form, God. In the metaphysics of Plotinus, God is the one. He didn't create the world, but the world came out of God due to a necessary flowing over of the divine. And then there is Meister Eckhart, a medieval German mystic. He has written wonderful things. He says, the existence of things in the empirical world is due to an actualization of their virtual being. It's crazy. He, used, he invented this term of virtual states. When you see something, when you discover something like it, you have to think, what is going on in the human mind that make these synchronicities possible? Oh, then, you know, there's Kashmir Shaivism. The visible world comes out of spanda, subtle vibrations, throbs in the divine. Am I supposed to believe that Schrodinger's wave functions are throbs in the divine? When I was a young man, I was obsessed with waves. I loved ocean waves. So finally, I started to paint oceans. My paintings had a problem because the waves came out of the sky. I had no idea why. One of my friends said, see a doctor. <laughs> but you see, my wife, Gabrielle, she's, she thought it was cute, so I couldn't care less what this man said. Every, every time I painted waves, they came out of the sky. Now I know there's a lesson. Let the spanda come out of you. We have to make sure that we stay serious here. And seriously, all the things I've talked to you about, they're impossible. I mean, it's a scandal. Get, get this man out of here. You know, in previous centuries, I would have been put on fire. Um, our society is, is more humane. We don't put people on stake. We just say, you are fired. So what I'd like to suggest is the discovery of the quantum phenomena signifies a metamorphosis of our consciousness, a mutation as though evolution was making a jump into a new species. And you know, it happens at a time. It, I want to get to it. No, why do I not? It happens at a time when such evolutions are necessary. I cannot get the one in between. So changes of evolution have happened before. They were described by Jean Gebser. 
He described how in our history we have gone from an archaic structure to a magic, a mythical, a mental, and now he says to an integrative structure. It can integrate seemingly incompatible opposites. A metamorphosis of the mind is needed because the mindset of classical physics has driven this world into a crisis. In a globalizing world, we can no longer live with Newton's materialism and Darwin's virtues of greed and aggression. They are a disaster. In The Evolution of Ethics, Michael Ruse and E.O. Wilson write, ethics as we understand it is an illusion fobbed off on us by our genes to get us to cooperate. Well, in a world that has no moral principles, are you amazed by the current state, the violence all over, the murders, the religious wars, the suppression of women, and so on? Don't worry about it. They're just sporting events in a Darwinian arena. I don't know how you like it, you know, when you take a flight and you sit in cattle class and, and your seat is about half as big as it ought to be, and then the captain comes on and says, just sit back, relax, and enjoy your flight. <laughs> in such a world, an economic order is quite natural in which the greed of the fittest can ruin the rest of humanity. How did, I, how did Darwin describe it? There should be open competition for all men. And ladies, he did mean men. And the most able should not be prevented by laws or customs from succeeding best. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of this stuff. We need a change of mind big time, a metamorphosis. In a holistic universe, cosmic order can be a model for human order. There's no conflict between a spiritual view of the world and a rational view. And we have a basis for creating human order based on cooperation, not competition, and kindness, not aggression. This, whoops, yeah, now what do we do? This is the, this is the integrative spirit talking to you. Thank you, Deepak, for your spirit to get us all together. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Just a minute. So actually, I don't have any questions for you because I agree with everything you say. Uh, now that worries me. <laughs> but a couple of things, I think, it, which has to do with words. And you reminded me once that uh, when we don't consider anything important, what do we say? Right. The, we talked about in the context of your language washes your brain. In other words, often people say, okay, objectively taken, I have to say this and that. There's nothing you can say objectively because you, you express it in a language that language already programs you. So Deepak's example, what do we say when something is unimportant? Maybe. It doesn't matter. Because, it does not matter. Because if it doesn't matter, it do, it's immaterial. It doesn't matter. What's that German word, uh, Wirklicht? The German word? Wirklicht. 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 Oh, yes. No, there was another example of when something is real. Reality. Where does it come from? Latin res. Things. Things are real. That's the only word the English language has for reality, for this meaning of reality. The German has two. It's the same, realität is the same as reality, but it also has Wirklichkeit, which means it can act on you. It doesn't have to be a thing, but it's real. It programs the mind. In other words, you don't look for something that that isn't a thing to be real if your language doesn't let you. The word is the flesh. The word is the flesh. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>